Welcome back to the factory this week. The proto boards have arrived for the perfect proto board. We have a major update for PikaDev and we take a sneak peek at KiCad 6. Let's do it. Yes, last week we began our quest for the perfect proto board. Today, the prototypes have arrived and there's even been a few design changes between now and then. So let's take a closer look at what's been changed. We've made some minor changes to the artwork just to make things a little bit clearer to read. The bus labels have changed and that's because on the back, we've actually included some solder jumper options so that you can easily connect those power input options to the center bus. So you'll see that the center bus is labeled positive and negative while every other bus just has a bus number. So by soldering these jumpers on the back, you can select whether the say USB connector or the DC jack connector or either of the terminals connect to that center bus. And that way you can get power into the breadboard without soldering any wires. You're just soldering on the socket or the terminals and just closing those jumpers. I guess the side effect of that is that you can also route power from one option to the other by closing multiple jumpers. The other buses are left unconnected. You can, of course you can connect them if you want, but we've also lined them up with some of the power input options to make connecting to that option really, really easy. For instance, on the USB side, the connections for USB power are on the same line as that bus. So you can just drop in like a bit of pre-cut breadboard wire or like a trimmed off bit of resistor lead and easily close that gap and deliver power to this bus. And likewise on the DC jack side, it's all on a 2.5 millimeter grid, so you can easily close that gap if you want to and deliver power directly to that center bus as well. And so we've tried to indicate that functionality as clearly as we can on the back with this artwork that kind of outlines all the power options and also the polarity of each jumper that you might want to solder so that maybe you only want to connect all the grounds together, that's okay. And so likewise for the four-way terminals, each terminal that relates to power delivery, we've also just marked that out with some silk screen just to help things along. And you might be wondering why this ugly bit of red tape is at the bottom of the breadboard. That's where the name of the product is gonna go and I'm, I'm just not quite ready to release that yet. It's not my baby to name, but stay tuned for that. And of course we tested it with the accessories as promised. There's the USB-B connector, there's the DC jack, and here's some five millimeter terminals. Nice. One pretty common experience when you're prototyping on a regular breadboard with say a Raspberry Pi Pico or a particle argon, you know, those kind of uh, dip style dev boards. When you put them on the breadboard, you wind up with only two connection rows on either side. You've only got two options for each pin. As we were designing this breadboard, we also stuck to that tradition. We put in five tie points. But once those prototypes come in, we, we can see there's quite a lot of extra space with those buses. Wouldn't it be nice to deviate from tradition a little bit and increase that to six per side? That means that when you bring in a Raspberry Pi Pico, for example, there's an extra tie point per row, bringing it to three instead of two. And that can really be, you know, that could really save the day. So we've already got a design revision in works and I expect that'll be the final one. I'm looking forward to that arriving. And of course, while we were at it, we decided to put in a design for a full size and half size breadboard design. These are with circular tie points tied in rows across the back. And these ones already have that update with six tie points per row. It's pretty tricky to make out, but there is actually a silk line in between each tie point to indicate what are rows and what are columns, say with the six along the row here and then the vertical bus down the middle. In the next revision of this, we'll increase that thickness so that it's a little bit easier to see. So we've got the full size, we've got the half size, and we're running a little experiment with just a point-to-point -point wiring proto board on FR4, we've got three different spacings for the pads. We have 200 micron, 300 and 400 micron. And we just had to know what would give the best soldering experience. So onto the microscope here, soldering the 200 micron pads. And these are about at the limit of what the manufacturer can put mask in between. There's mask in between a lot of the tires, but it's also flaking off because it's just too thin in between those pads. So while it's very easy to make bridges, it's probably a little bit tricky to clear mistakes, for example, trying to, trying to wipe solder from in between two pads. With 300 micron spacing, the solder mask is much more reliable. 
and it's still easy enough to create bridges, although it is much easier to clear unintended bridges. And you know, the same is true for the 400 micron as well. So at this point, it's probably going to be one of these two sizes. We found that having mask was probably preferable to not having mask, just to make it a little bit easier for beginners to clear mistakes. And also just looks nicer around areas where there are no tie points, just a, a little bit more of a familiar aesthetic. From last week's video, Ian Burtonshaw says to please make them pre-tint to make soldering much easier. And also that they've had experience with proto boards in the past where they drop pads as you solder them. Well, I can tell you that these are honest to goodness FR4 with lead free hot air leveled solder as the finish. They are pre-tinned. Now, of course, you can drop a pad if you if you really gouge at it with a hot iron. But here's a, a little demonstration of me soldering a pin and trying to tear it out and I just break the pin instead. So successful test drive. I think we're ready to put these into production. In PicoDev news yesterday, we silently released a bit of a major and overdue upgrade for PicoDev. PicoDev can now work across user selectable I2C buses. Before it was defaulting to whichever I2C bus was default for the hardware platform you were working on. Say for a Pico, it was I2C 0. For a Raspberry Pi, it was I2C 1. Now when you initialize a device, the bus is user selectable and that means that say for this distance sensor that has a single fixed address, we can now operate two just by having one wired to one bus and the other wired to another bus. And you can see a live demo running here where I have two unique distances being plotted in the shell and on the plotter and I can measure and I can measure those two devices independently. And this is what I mean. This is actually the distance sensor example code that I've just modified very slightly to include the second sensor. And you can see that here, distance sensor one is initialized as per usual with PicoDev, but we have a second distance sensor and all we need to do is pass it the argument bus equals one to use I squared C bus number one. And then you can just treat them as independent sensors, call read on both and print the results. And finally, a preview of something that we've been working on this week. This is a power timer, but it's not really the design I want to talk about. You might notice that KiCad here looks a little different, and that's because we're experimenting with KiCad 5.99, which is the, the release candidate for the upcoming KiCad 6. Now, why would, why would we pull the trigger on going to a nightly build of KiCad when KiCad 5 has so far served us very well? If I jump into the CAD viewer and flip to the back side of the board, you might notice this nice little design feature here. This is unusual for KiCad. KiCad, you know, in, you're used to seeing the, the standard KiCad silk screen font, but here we have these nice kind of negative labels and in, in a different font. What's going on here? KiCad 6 is actually compatible with a plugin called KeyBuzzard. Buzzard is a project by SparkFun that they created for Eagle to create those really nice aesthetic labels. And so of course the open source community does what the open source community does. Over on GitHub, Greg Davil has ported Buzzard to KeyBuzzard, so it's now compatible with KiCad. What that means is, with the click of a button, we can now open this pane and enter in some sample text. A feature that's long overdue for KiCad is being able to change that font. But I think what makes this really nice is the ability to add end caps. So if you add these two round end caps, you get that nice pill shape that we've been trying to emulate on all our PicoDev modules so far. And to do that, we have to actually illustrate the label in say Illustrator or in Inkscape and then import it as a footprint into KiCad. And we have to manually curate all of these labels. Now you can just create them on the fly using KeyBuzzard. So this is a major workflow upgrade for these modules that are all gonna need you know, pretty custom labels. In the case of this power timer, we would have had to make one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We would have had to make seven graphical assets and then import them as footprints. Nah, forget it. Now we can just make them on the fly as we need. Appreciate you, Greg. So it's likely that in the weeks and months to follow, we'll probably upgrade all of our machines to use KiCad 5.99 slash KiCad 6. Because at the moment, like it's, it's pretty stable and the quality of life upgrades can't really be ignored, especially for making beautiful boards. In any case, that's all I have for you today. I've already noticed that KiCad 6 has loads of quality of life upgrades, so we may do a video on that in the future. If you have any questions or if you'd like to see anything a little bit closer, open a thread on the Core Electronics forums. Until next time, thanks for watching. Ooh, no.